Whatever the origin of the basin, and it must remain at the moment enigmatic, the value of its ore and the richness of the metal deposits in Sudbury is not in any doubt at all. Last week we looked at some film of the early mining methods. Let's end by looking at the way that the ore was smelted at the beginning of this century. In a typical mine at that time, getting the ore to the surface for smelting entailed first measuring it out from the underground loading bins into large ore buckets or skips, each skip taking about four tons of ore. And the skips themselves weighed three tons. The skips and the ore were hauled to the surface using a system of counterbalances a heavy counterweight drawing the skip to the surface to the first step of the processing. In this stage, the ore went through a series of crushing and sorting operations rather dissimilar to those employed today in getting the ore ready for smelting. The purpose then is now being to separate the barren rock from the sulphide ore. On picking bolts, waste rock, low-grade ore and high-grade ore were separated not a, an operation that one sees very often today. Once sorted out from the rock, the ore was sent to the Mond Nickel Company smelter at Coniston, about eight miles east of Sudbury. The smelter, built in 1913, about two years before this film was made, was the most up-to-date in the Sudbury area, which hitherto had been devastated by the open roasting of ore. The Coniston town site, built for the smelter workers was already a rather bleak place. The smelter was closed down in the early 1970s in favour of the Copper Cliff smelter to the west of Sudbury. But in 1915, Coniston was the smelter to which all the ore of the Mon Nickel Company was sent. The ore which entered the smelter was first weighed in the car in which it arrived. Production of ore was generally ahead of what the smelter could handle, and much of the ore was simply stockpiled in the storage yard. Working at full capacity, the smelter could probably handle about 3,000 tons of ore per day, a very large figure for that time. Everything in 1915 was working full out to satisfy the wartime demand. One of the metallurgically most interesting advances in smelting technology employed at the Coniston smelter was flotation. In this process, the low-grade ore was first taken from the storage yard to the flotation mill. Ore, which contained only about 15 or 20 pounds of nickel and copper sulfide per ton, had previously been rejected, but it was now enriched in the flotation mill. After crushing and grinding, the low-grade ore was passed over concentrator tables as a fine powder. The water washed the lighter waste rock material to the sides, and the sulfide ore came out as a slurry at the end. And then it was mixed with pine oil and sulfuric acid, and the sulfide particles floated to the surface with bubbles of air introduced by the paddles. This is a process common today. The very fine ore dust produced by flotation was not suitable for the furnaces, and Mon Nickel therefore roasted the fines, as they were called, in a sintering plant. This differed from the process employed at Copper Cliff. The sintering plant needed to be carefully loaded. The coarse grains at the top and the fine at the, the coarse grains at the bottom and the fine at the top, so that the sintering beds would burn when the oil blast was forced through the porous ore. In this way, the particles were bound together, and about 15% of the sulfur in the ore was lost, driven off as sulfur dioxide. The sponge-like sinter was much better furnace fuel because of its porosity, and furnaces were the next stage in the smelting process. First, the ore was transported from the sintering plant to the furnaces, usually again being kept in storage bins until the furnaces could accommodate it. The furnaces were the central part of the smelting process. The aim not being to produce pure copper and nickel, but to produce a so-called mat. 
low in sulfur and rich in metals, which could then be chemically or electrolytically refined. This last stage was carried out in Wales, in the United Kingdom, where Mond had built a plant for the nickel refining process he invented. High-grade ore direct from the storage yard and sinter from the roasting plant were mixed with limestone and coke and burned in the furnace. Connison had four furnaces, each with a capacity of about 750 tons per day of ore, averaging about 4.5%. The principle of smelting was an old one. The limestone added in the separation process acted as a means of floating off the waste rock, which came out as slag, which was then poured onto the slag dumps, an operation that many visitors to Sudbury and many Sudburyans have see every day. About a thousand tons or 25 slag pots, each holding about four tons, were poured onto this slag dump every day. This was the initial separation of the rock, the waste rock from the ore. The nickel and copper sulfide still remain to be separated from the iron. At the same time as the rock floated to the surface in the settler, the metal sank to the bottom. This enriched the ore from about 4.5% to 16%. Quite a deal more enrichment still needed to be done. But first the furnace mat, rich in metals, was drawn off in great ladles. 15 tons of molten metal being taken at a time from the, from the so-called settler. The further enrichment of the cool metal was similar to that of the blast furnaces. Quartz being added in order to combine with the iron, which was the unwanted sulfide, and so enrich the final mat in copper and nickel. Oxygen was introduced at this stage to burn off the sulfur, and then the final mat was poured off to cool. The mat now consisted of about 80% copper and nickel. After cooling, the ore was broken, or the mat was broken and crushed. And it was this product which then went to be refined. And it was the refining which, of course, posed the big problems, the separation of the copper and the nickel. The mat was always crushed to a powder for transport and for selling, and loaded into barrels. Something in the order of 20 million pounds of nickel and something less copper were produced each year in the Sudbury area around about 1910. It was not until later that refining plants were available in Canada for the refining of this mat. Before it ever became nickel or became incorporated in steel plates, this mat had to go as far as England. One of the large refineries which took over from uh, this was in Port Colburn, a refinery that's still operating. The ore first transported to the Atlantic coast for shipment to England. Repair shops on the surface were well equipped for the repairing of machinery. Increasing mechanization and the introduction of electricity